Good morning. I am uh, under a vocal order from my therapist. I have uh, been doing some vocal therapy for the last four months as a result of some sickness and some bad decisions and a little uh, acid reflux and 30 years of preaching. So the goal, um, I'm not as comfortable up here as I am down there looking you in the eye, but I'll do, I will manage. Um, so the goal um, really is for you to, to um, either ask some good questions or be prepared to answer some. Recognizing, um, and I always like to say this because, and I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when I was in basic training, um, in the, in the Army at Fort Dix, New Jersey, we had 21 hours of what they called judo. Now they would call it self-defense. Uh, I don't know. They called it, uh, you know, judo training. And so we went through about 21 hours of that. And I'll never forget, at the end of that, the drill sergeant said, uh, Men, I want you to know that you've learned just enough to kill yourself. So um, I like to think um, that there is a lot out there that I do not know. So um, in case you're wondering, I don't know it all. I haven't figured it all out, and I don't have all the answers. So once, once we get that out of the way, um, we're good. Um, I have known the Steenwikes, like I said, for 25, 30 years, um, particularly their... Um, is, is Mike your oldest son? Yeah. And their oldest son and family. And uh, we've shared uh, time on the board at Freedom together. And it's been a joy. Secretly, I have this wish that I someday can become a Steenwike. Um, but there's a couple of things just not working in my favor. Um, I don't know anything about farms and my, and my uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just probably not going to make it. I have been married to my wife, um, who is known as the bombshell in my eyes for 44 years. We have three grown children, um, and uh, they are all married, and they married well. And um, I have uh, 10, 10 grandchildren, and they are spread across uh, three different states. So tonight, um, after I do a couple more jobs, I'm leaving to spend a few days with our son in New York, and then I'll be back Saturday, because I am the pastor at uh, Lake Community Bible Church in Baldwin. You're always welcome to come up and see us at Big Star Lake. Certainly would love to have you. And um, I do do a few other things. Um, I want to say just a little bit about the course and about why I think it's important. Um, our three children um, uh, grew up, obviously, in a pastor's household. I pastored Robinson Baptist Church for almost 14 years, uh, followed John Caulfield there. Um, and, um, you know, our kids uh, had great training. I'd like to think they had great training at home. They had great training in our church, but they had great training, um, and two of them anyway, at Freedom Baptist Schools. And then uh, two of them went off to Cedarville, and um, all of them are doing well. And um, I like to say have their heads screwed on straight and are involved in their own individual churches. And I really believe that in part it's because Debbie and I have tried um, to give them a sense of the value of Scripture, the value of study, uh, the value of intentional work. So what I want to share with you over the ensuing weeks, if that all works out, is a course uh, about how to study the Bible. Uh, there's a great passage, you don't have to turn there, but there's a great passage in 1 Thessalonians where Paul is commending the Thessalonians, and somewhere down in chapter 1 he says to them, you know, the great thing about this is we don't, we don't even have to say anything because you have carried forth the message you have mimicked the message, and you now have carried it forth. We don't need to do anything. And what a great idea for a pastor or anyone involved in ministry is to work themselves out of a job. That's what all missionaries really want to do. They want to work themselves out of a job. They want to be able to present in such a way that the folks uh, involved would pick that up and, um, and carry the ball, and they can move on to uh, other things. So... 
What, I, uh, what I'm going to do over the course of the ensuing weeks is to try to cover a number of things, a number of areas that relate to good basic Bible study. The formal term for that is hermeneutics. It simply means the science of Bible study. The science of Bible study. So I do think there is some intentional work in that. And, um, you know, I should say, um, of, of, all, of all the training I had, I looked forward the most over the years to uh, attending uh, Dallas Seminary because there were folks there that I had read all of my life. Uh, you know, folks like, uh, 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 what's his name? Um, uh, Pentecost. It, it's what happens when you got up at 345. Uh, Dwight Pentecost, for one. Uh, John Hanna for another, uh, Howie Hendricks for a third, Chuck Swindoll for a fourth. I missed most of those guys, but I did get to sit under Howie Hendricks and Swindoll, and those were key elements in, in my life. And I mention that because one of the books I'm going to mention to you, if you want to get it, is a book uh, by Howie Hendricks. Actually, it was written um, with him and his son, William, Bill, and... Um, just, just imagine, by the way, uh, Howie Hendricks was at Dallas Seminary for 60 years, six decades teaching students the scriptures. It's estimated that Hendricks, over the course of his career, taught 30,000 students the Bible, of whom people like um, Tony Evans, Swindoll, Chip Ingram, and um, a, a host, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Dennis Rainey. Uh, just, just, just imagine that, being anywhere at the same place for, for 30, 40, 60 years and uh, teaching 30,000 students. So the book I have, and you can look it up on Amazon. I'm not selling books. I don't get anything for it. I've used this book over the years uh, in teaching this course uh, at Grace Bible College. It's simply called Living by the Book. That's what it looks like. It's not terribly expensive. It's very, very readable. It's not, it's not written for particularly for theologians, although I think it's sound. Um, it's a good book, Living by the Book, The Art and Science of, of Reading the Bible uh, by uh, Howie Hendricks. And uh, I think uh, that's valuable uh, if you want to. I'll be alluding to that. Uh, anytime you see in your syllabus where it says, in fact, uh, let's see here. Anytime where it says the basics of good Bible study, I've drawn material um, from some of what Hendricks has said, and I'm very conscious of you knowing that um, you know you give you give a man or you give a person credit for what they've done. You don't try to to steal their material and call it your own. And so I want to give fair credit. Um, I've drawn material from other places um, for what I'm going to say to you, um, but uh, that's primarily uh, where we want to go. All right, so it is up, up there a little bit yet. So the course that I have taught now for about 10 years um, to students at Grace Bible College, and actually um, when I was teaching at Libertas, I, you know, I tried to incorporate this into 7th and 8th grade Bible um, is the whole idea of, what, of unlocking the truths, I think, uh, from Scripture at one paragraph at a time. Um, now, uh, what I am going to say a, a lot, I'm so used to roaming that I have this, this great desire to just walk among you. I'm going to try to resist that. Um, the question I am going to repeatedly ask you is, what do you see? In other words, the journey always begun, begins with a question. What is it that you see in the text? Because what I'm going to suggest to you that, that in any time you're studying the Bible, before you run off and grab a commentary and find out what Moody thinks and what MacArthur thinks or, or any of the other great commentators, and there are a lot of them out there living and gone, then, then it's important in, from my standpoint that you understand what, what does the text say? What do you see in the text? So in a couple occasions, in a few minutes, I'm going to just, you know, we're, we're just going to try this. 
And by the way, I think I will be done by 10, 10, or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or whatever that is back there before the floor drops out on me. Because um, my basic premise is uh, I don't have to fit it all in. Uh, I can always come back next week, um, assuming that's possible. I can always come back next week and, and pick it up where we left off. So from my standpoint... The question always begins, and this is whether, whether I'm teaching a, a class for high schoolers or whether I'm preparing for a sermon, I always do the same thing. I look at the text and I ask the question, what do I see? What do I see for key words? What do I see for clauses? What do I see for quotations? What do I see for subjects and verbs? You remember those, right, when you were taught those in English class? What do I see? Uh, are there places that make sense to me? Uh, In in other words, is is there geography that I'm going to need to understand? I mean, if you think about it, you read the story of the the Good Samaritan and the man that traveled from Jerusalem down on the road and and he fell among thieves. And sometimes that doesn't make a lot of sense to us until we realize that there is like a 2,000 or 3,000 foot elevation drop from one place to the other and and you find yourself on a lot of hairpin turns and easily... A uh, person could have get overwhelmed on that. So those kinds of things um, uh, matter. So I, I'm going to continue to, to ask that question. I would like you to take your Bible, though, please, uh, if you would, and turn. Just a second here. I've got to try to get this, the technology. I, I, I'm in technology. When we're, when we're talking about technology, I've certainly uh, learned enough to kill myself. So that's where I, uh, okay, what happened to all my good notes that I put in? Good question. Uh, Well, let's see. Hold on. Aha. There we go. So I want to I want to start. um, Well, before I get you to to the passage, I want to I want to go over a couple of introductory things. there's a difference, um, first of all, and I almost hesitate to write anything on the board. Uh, my students at Libertas knew this. My students at Great, Grace knew this. I flunked penmanship, and my writing is abysmal, all right? But there are two words, and I, um, I will write them up here, and I will then... I will say them to you, and this probably is about as technical as I'm going to get today, and that's probably not big enough for you to see, but the two words I want you to understand are exegesis and eisegesis. So, E-X hyphen, E-G-E-S-I-S. E-X hyphen, E-G-E-S-I-S. The other word is eisegesis, and, it, and it's E-I-S hyphen E-G-E-S-I-S. So in other words, the last sections are the same. And this will help you in the language. X means out of, out of. He comes out of the water, we'll say. It would have that prefix. This means into. Out of, out of, into. Everybody with me? Out of, into. Yeah, I won't ask you to say it. So when we do good Bible study, we are doing exegesis. In other words, what we want to know is what does the text have to say to us? Does that make sense? What is the text saying to us? We want the text to say to us what the message is. This, because I said this prefix means into, means I am now reading into the text what I want it to say. Now one of the reasons that good Bible study always begins with reading the scripture itself is because we all bring certain biases into our study. Oh, we like MacArthur because, or we like R.C. Sproul, or we like Chip Ingram. Well, those, all of us, those men and, and little old me, we all have prejudices. We all bring cultural prejudices. We all bring 
uh, geographical preferences, and we always have to be careful that we don't read our, under, our prejudices and our biases into the text and make it say what we want to say. So what I'm always, I love being able to draw circles, what I am always going to argue is I want you, I want myself to, to learn from God's word on the basis of what the text has to say to me. And so before I ever go to a commentary for any message or any study or anything that I preach, I'm always going over the text. What are the, what's the sentence structure like? What, where, where are the places? Where are the quotations? Well, you know, what is the context of the passage? And I think that will help us. Now, I want you to look at a couple of passages with me before we go on. Uh, Luke chapter 24, please. I've got like, uh, oh, I don't know, just a couple of passages here. Um, Luke 24, first of all. And this is a very familiar passage, so... The word from which we get hermeneutics, and you don't have to know this. Oh, by the way, there will be no test. Everybody glad? There will be no test. Does that give me another five minutes? No, I don't know. Okay. By the way, um, I also do not permit unhappiness in here. Um, and, and since I minister to a group of older folks, here's, and, and because I am an older guy, I am, I am, I never thought I'd be 65. Here I am. Do you know what I've discovered? Sometimes as we get older, th more things bug us. You know, they just don't do that right. And sometimes you just got to say, you know, it's okay. God's, God loves me and Jesus is coming. How's that work? Does that work all right? So anyway, hermeneutics, the science of good Bible study really has to do with the three, the three little passages I'm going to give you because it really suggests hermeneutics means that we find in Scripture an explanation of what God wants to say to us under, under inspiration. Now I'll get, we're going to talk about inspiration and all of that good stuff. Uh, anyway, but so in hermeneutics, we want, we want God to teach us. We want the Scriptures, here's another word you might like, to be opened up. That's kind of what it means. All right, Luke 24. Jesus, of course, is on the road to Emmaus here. And if you drop down to... Um, oh, uh, let's, let's, look at, um, let's look at... Let's begin at verse 25. One of my famous habits is, if I've written down a text and a verse, I always back up about two verses, and people have just come to get used to it at Lake Community, at... Uh, and at Robinson, they did too. They just laughed at me. That's fine. I'll get them in the next life. Um, no, I'm kidding. And he said to them, verse 25, Luke 24. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning, and I love this. So, uh, the distance between um, Emmaus and Jerusalem, if I remember correctly, is seven miles, I think. The average person walks, at least me, I walk about 15 minutes per mile. So if you do the math, how long was Jesus talking to these disciples? A couple of hours, right? So check this out. Longest Bible study that no one ever wanted to leave. So don't worry, I won't, I won't go this time. I won't follow that time. Okay, and beginning with the Moses and the prophets, he interpreted them. Here's the, here's the word, all right? Verse 27, he interpreted them. He opened up the scriptures. He explained the truth. Now just imagine, just wrap your mind around for a moment what it must have been like for Jesus himself, the Lord of glory, to exegete the truth. I mean... From Moses and the prophets, he explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what you have here is Jesus opening up the text of scripture, 
hermanoing, in other words, from where we get hermeneutics, giving them a first-hand front-row seat of everything from Moses to the prophets, all the Old Testament, concerning himself. He exegeted the truth by opening up and explaining to them the truth. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Thanks. There you go. You can do this. Acts 8.31. Here, here is the story of another famous text that Luke, uh, or Luke addresses. And, of course, it's Philip and the eunuch. And uh, I'll begin at verse 26. Man, time's already gone. All right, uh, verse 26, 8, 26. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. That is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candon's queen of Nuke, a court official, of, I'm sorry, of Ethiopian, excuse me, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he came, um, he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot chariot and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. I think by the way he was a God follower or a God interested person but not a believer. And the spirit said to Philip verse 29 go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah uh, the prophet and asked do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31 how can I unless someone guides me? Someone hermanos me. Someone opens up the text and explains it to me. And so, you know what happens next, and he does that very thing. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.15. This will be very familiar to you, obviously. 2 Timothy 2.15. Same word picture here. Very famous passage. 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who need, need no need to be ashamed. Here it is. Rightly handling the word of truth has the same basic concept of the other two, except here Paul adds another distinction. And that is this idea, the word comes from a word picture too, of, of cutting it straight. In other words, doing, being so diligent in our study that we cut a straight path from the text to our understanding. And by the way, um, does anybody remember what Paul's occupation was? What was he? Tent maker. Which means here and there he was involved with fabric. And you and I both know, I'm, my first grade teacher said to my mother in about 1963, she said, Mark is a wonderful boy, but he can't cut straight. I couldn't. I couldn't handle scissors. I still can't. Can't cut a straight line to save my life. But can you imagine what happens if you don't uh, cut straight a piece of material that you're going to sew together with a tent? So as we do with tents, or as Paul did with tents, we do with the scripture. We want to cut it straight. We want to handle it correctly. We want to handle it accurately. The whole business of Bible study, folks, is unlocking the truth. It's a problem-solving method and method of inquiry. And our understanding is not located in personal whim. Turn over quickly to 2 Peter chapter 1, please. I'll, I'll be coming back to this because when we talk about inspiration, we'll, we'll, we'll hit this. 2 Peter chapter 1 
Actually, we'll back up to verse 20. 2 Peter 1, verse 20. Knowing the, this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Uh, put it another way, someone's own whim. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I'll say this again, but that word is the same word that Paul uses in Acts 27 when, when he says that the ship was carried along by the wind where the wind wanted it to go. Here, the, uh, the understanding is, uh, I don't make this up as I go along. I depend on the Holy Spirit to push me into understanding because that's how the text of Scripture was created. And we'll talk more about inspiration later. But a good understanding of Scripture is not done in personal whim. It's done by surrendering uh, to the Spirit's activity. All right. Um, as long as you're in 2 Peter, I want you to back up to chapter 1, please. Because every journey must have a goal. Every journey must have a goal. And I love this passage for a number of reasons. Um, I did my, um, my doctoral work on a guy named Jonathan Edwards, who was a Puritan theologian and pastor um, in, um, in Massachusetts in the 1700s. Uh, he's a wonderfully interesting guy. Um, <laughs> his church had enough of him after a few years. And, believe it, and he was pastoring at what was called, uh, I think, uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. He was the closest thing that you could ever say to a mega church. He had like 500 members, and they got mad at him after a while, and they fired him because he had a disagreement with his his uh, his grandfather. Or yeah, and uh, you know the funny thing back though, they couldn't find anybody to preach, so they called him back, preached uh, as an interim for quite a while. But I I my dissertation was concerned with the spiritual disciplines of. Of, of life. And I looked at about 600 or 700 of his sermons to see if he really believed in his preaching what he taught in his life. Well, the reason I mention that is if you look at verse 3 in 2 Peter 1, take a look at that. Now, uh, I've spread this over three slides because um, I, I needed to keep that big enough. Is that big enough, by the way, where you can see it? Oh, goody. All right. The journey must have the goal. I love this passage. And I'm probably going to get excited. I don't get excited much, but I probably am. Okay? Look at verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Stop. In other words, everything you and I need to function in a difficult and a contrary and a world that's lost its way is given to us through divine power. Isn't that great? Yes. Thank you. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Look at this. Verse 4. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become, look at this, partakers of the divine nature. Stop. It doesn't mean we're all going to become little gods, but what it does mean is that literally as we walk with Christ and, and develop the maturity that he wants us to have, we tap into the divine nature. Wow. Or as my kids would say, or maybe they didn't, cool. I guess I said that. Or radical. Or awesome, man. Anyway, keep going. Because now begins a very long sentence. And, and remember I said to you that, that words matter. If I didn't, I'm saying it now. Words matter. Okay? Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. I guess I should probably 
turn um, those that way, okay? All right. Verse 8. Now look at this. For if these qualities are yours and increasing. Now, if you notice in the, the slides, I've highlighted a couple of things. Did I highlight anything back here? I did. The partakers of the divine nation. Okay. But I've highlighted the increasing part. Because what it suggests, if I can just stop here for a minute, is a life that's on the move. I personally want to keep reading and keep learning until God calls me home. I'm not looking to stop my, my learning. I'm not looking to stop preaching. I'm not looking to stop growing. I'm not looking to stop, to stop uh, learning new things. I'm try I've, spent, I've spent my life... And, you know, my mother, when she was living, said, you know, Mark, are you ever going to, you know, get, out, get done going to school and get a real job? You know, part of it for me, and, and early on, I, I didn't always get a lot of encouragement from the churches where I was serving. But it was tremendously important for me to sharpen the tools so that I could be as effective in ministry for the longest period of time that I could possibly be. One of my heroes is Swindoll. He's 86. I happened to meet him on a couple of occasions, and I developed a friendship with a, a, a friend of his, a guy on his staff. And I asked the guy on his staff, whose name was Taylor Gardner, I said, hey, you and Chuck ever going to retire? This was probably 10 years ago. Eh, I don't know, he says. Uh, Chuck and I just kind of feel like if we can keep going, we're just going to keep doing it. 86, Chuck Swindoll gets up every Sunday, preaches the word effectively in truth. I, I have a secret desire that if God's going to take me home, it's either in, in the pulpit or on my bicycle. Look at that. If these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of Christ. Look at that. At our ages and beyond, we have the opportunity to continue to be effective as we develop the tools in our life to minister the gospel and to develop people who will be servants of the living God. And I can't think of a better time in life in the culture to do it. Can you? I've spent 30 years in, in pastoral ministry. And yet my greatest priority is yet to be accomplished. Because my, my, my priority now, and, and it's, it's why I do what I do, because I have three children and my desire is to be that Job grandpa, that Job dad and that Job grandpa. If you read the text of Job chapter 1, you recognize that Job not only was concerned about the sins they had already done, but he was out, uh, concerned about the sins that they might do. And, and, and so I want to be the kind of dad and the kind of grandpa who is intentional in my kids' and my grandchildren's lives. And you have to too. Because this, this culture is running aground. And the hardest thing I've found over the years for parents and now grandparents is to pass that baton into something that the kids recognize and can make their own. I'm not creating little marks. Far from it. My two boys are much better dads than I ever was. But um, that's my goal. So Bible study to me isn't just a nice little thing that we throw around. It's the, the task of passing the baton. If you look at the remainder of the text, and I've got to kind of finish up here. For Verse 9 says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Number 10, verse 10, therefore, brethren, look at this, and I put this one in the text in, in highlighted yellow. Be all the more diligent. It suggests work. It suggests effort. 
to make certain about his calling and choosing for you for as long, here's another word, another action word, I should have highlighted it, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. When I was 16 years old, I chose from myself, having rededicated my life, a verse that has stuck with me ever since, and it's a wonderful verse, 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, what is the rest? Do all for the glory of God. All right. Um, let's do the next slide, if we can. Um, why should we study the Bible? And I, I think what I'm going to do, I think what I'm going to do is highlight these and come back to them next week. I, I needed to kind of get a feel of how much, how much I can do. And I kind of was a little concerned, uh, where would the farm report go? And how would that, how would that kind of affect the, you know, the, the, the scriptural teaching? Let's see, I got I to gotta follow the farm report. And that's pretty hard. That's a hard act to follow, you know. You didn't get into that whole thing. I was telling my therapist about you, that whole thing where you tell them about how many days it has to be so hot and how many, you know, that, yeah, you didn't, yeah, you didn't tell them about that. Did you ever tell them about that? Okay, all right, okay. Why should I study the Bible? And I'm, I'll, I'll let you for homework, as it were, look up these passages and we'll talk about them next week and then I want to leave you with one more slide and then I think I'll be done. And then I'll fit that 1010 thing. Um, why should we study the Bible? Number one, it's essential to spiritual growth. It's a feeding. And that's the, you know, you know the, 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 the passage where Peter says, uh, like, like milk, you should desire this. We'll come back to that next week. But at least you've, you hear me saying it. Why do we need good Bible study? Well, it's essential for spiritual growth. And three words that are associated with that relate, and I'll come back to this again, our attitude about it, our appetite for it, and our aim in it. Our attitude about it, our appetite for it, and our aim in it. Um, the second reason I think we should study the Bible that seems pretty basic is that it is essential for our march towards maturity. Um, I happen to be preaching through Hebrews right now at Lake Community Bible, so I'm going to tackle this passage in a few weeks. But this is the passage where the writer says, you know, you should be at this point in your career, you should be teaching others the basic oracles, the stoicheia, the, the basic principles of the Christian life. But you, you're, not even, you're not doing that because you haven't even figured it all out yourself. You're not mature. You're still, you know, milk is a wonderful thing, saying that in front of a dairy farmer. Milk's a wonderful thing. But there comes a time in our life when we need something more than just milk. And that's the, the essence of the, the comment by the writer is, look, you should be much further down the road than you are. Thirdly, it is essential for effectiveness. This is where Paul, of course, tells Timothy that the word of God is is is. is divinely inspired it's breathed out as it were and it's and it's pr profitable for teaching for rebuke for reproof and all those other things training in righteousness and then he says so that so that the the believer will be equipped and ready for the task something to that effect we'll come back to it but it is essential for spiritual growth All right, so let me just give you three slide, or one last slide, if you can, and this is going to be our approach throughout um, our study. Um, three words that I want you to grab hold of, and these are courtesy of uh, Howie Hendrick. Um, relating to the text of Scripture, first of all, what do I see? In other words, and, and I mean basic stuff. What do I see? Well, I see, uh, I see uh, Pastor Mark, a place. Um, quickly, turn over to Acts 1-8. I'll just give you a, a, just, a, just a brief, just very brief, Acts 1-8. 
Jesus is preparing to ascend. I'm not going to, I'm going to give you a week where you don't have to answer. A actually, and I should say this to you. Um, I'm, I'm used to not necessarily in a teaching format being, you know, the, the lecturer. I'd like, you to re I'd like you to respond. Now, I don't know where you've been in your habit and all of that, so I, you know, that may not work out. But here's the thing I will say. Um, I have never heard a stupid question. All right? And I will never, ever belittle you um, for a, a question uh, that you've made. Um, and so I want you to think, but you know, what do I see? Acts 1 8. Okay. Uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What do I see? Well, I see places. I see Jerusalem. I see Jeru Judea. I see to the ends of the earth. I see, I see a, 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 what we call a cause and effect. Um, I'm going to receive the power, and then something's going to happen. Um, if you're, and hopefully, um, how can I say this kindly? Um, it's not a sin to write in your Bible. Unless you're writing, you know, Betty Loves Fred. Something like that. You know, mark up the Bible. Mark it up. What's the subject? What's the verb? What are the, what are the places? What do those places mean? How do they, you know, so there, there is no stupid question here. There is no um, minuscule uh, fact. Everything in the text becomes important. What do I see? Okay. Secondly, what does it mean? Now, I need to clarify something. You're going to hear me say it all the time. Um, and so here it goes. I suppose I should have put this on a slide. The text can never mean to you what it didn't mean to the original listeners. Okay? In other words, if we come up with some harebrained interpretation that is so far distant from what uh, the writers meant for that per person who was going to read that letter or that, that piece of parchment, then we have missed the boat. The text can never mean to me what it didn't mean to the original listeners. The text can never mean to Mark what it didn't mean to the, uh, the folks in Jerusalem in Acts 1.8. Okay? Uh, and that's kind of a basic tenet of good Bible study. And what that really argues is for the, the, the con what we call context. Um, part of my frustration sometimes with people who are of, an, of a persuasion where they see the Holy Spirit everywhere, and the Holy Spirit is everywhere, I mean, but they, you know what I, I think you know what I mean, is that many of the passages that they draw upon are out of the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is a wonderful book, but it's a transitional book. Things happen in the book of Acts that never happen again. They aren't part of the program of the epistles, of the letters. So in other words, interpretation matters. Thirdly, I love this part because in, when I used to teach speech at Grace Bible College, there's always what I call the so what question. After you've labored on for 15 minutes, so what? So what? What is it? So the application is, what do I do with it? What do I do with it? Um, it is Swindoll, by the way, who's credited with coming up with the term longhorn sermon. Do you know what a longhorn sermon is? It's a sermon with two points and a lot of bull in between, if that makes sense. Okay. All right? I thought you'd like that for, you know, the, that's my animal husbandry for the morning. Two points with a lot of bull in between. That's a longhorn sermon, okay? But the fact of the matter is, there needs to be application. What do I do with it? How do I put this on and walk with it? And we'll, we'll talk about all of that. Howie Hendricks was preaching to a group of businessmen And he asked them, what would happen if you operated your business with a similar knowledge level as the scriptures? And one man popped right up and said, 
we'd all be fired. We'd all be fired. My goal, folks, and you know, I'm, my life's focus now, increasingly, is this kind of ministry. Because my focus is helping folks not only have the right interpretation about what the, what the scripture says, but how do we put it in play? How do we make it work? What do we do with it? So that we can grow into that kind of person who need not be ashamed because he or she has rightly divided the truth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so very much for the patience of these folks. As we go our way now, I pray that you'll strengthen us. We live in a very difficult time, and yet, Father, you have... <laughs> there is no time that was greater than, than the first century, and no time harder. So give us... Uh, give us a strong unction, a good mind, a gracious attitude, and a love of the gospel. We thank you and ask this in Christ's name.